Okay, so we will get started with existentialism is a humanism. Uh, again, I'll stick around after class if anybody has any other questions or private concerns about constructing successful grades, passing the course, or whatever it is that you need help with, um, uh, questions about content are great too. Um, so we're finally on to Sartre, the father of existentialism. Who was Sartre? And how do you pronounce his name? If you need help, here's a helpful guide just below his very lovely picture. That's how you pronounce his name. Um, so Sartre is super brilliant uh, upper class uh, Frenchman um, who uh, ties for top philosopher in the civil service exam with his lifelong polyamorous partner, Simone de Beauvoir. Um, the civil service exam, it's the aggregation, or however you pronounce that. Um, it, it's an exam that you take in order to qualify for the best schools in France, like going to the Sorbonne. And uh, Beauvoir and uh, Sartre virtually tied. So Sartre just passed her, but it was his like second time taking it. And Beauvoir uh, didn't actually take any college classes. I don't think she was allowed or she just didn't have the like money to do it. Um, so she would just like audit and sit in every once in a while when a professor would let her. And so without like nearly as much training and uh, a whole extra try, she did just as well as Sartre did. Um, Anyways, they're both brilliant uh, civil philosophers, servants, and uh, uh, politicos as well. Um, so speaking of politics, Sartre is a lifelong Marxist, uh, spends his life defending Marxism and its different variations in uh, communist states early on, uh, Stalinist uh, Russia, the USSR, though he pulls back from uh, appreciating Stalin so much when it becomes public knowledge that Stalin has not been so kind to uh, the proletariat and um, common people of Russia. Uh, I think at the very end of his life, he, he becomes a, a Maoist, sort of strange old man craziness. You know, the, we all get old. Um, so uh, when he was young, after World War II, he travels to Soviet Russia and goes around and, and cavorts with all of these awesome uh, authors, uh, communist uh, intellectuals, uh, and, and gets like totally absorbed in, in that culture and, and is fascinated by um, the, the will to the people, um, the, the, the political power being given to the common person. And this is what Sartre um, develops his whole career around is giving power to the people, right? Taking it away from the bourgeois um, and uh, empowering the common man. In this quest, he uh, met Fidel and Che Guevara, um, kind of interesting crossover there. Uh, and ended his life as a Maoist, as I mentioned. Uh, he was a public intellectual. So Sartre isn't just a philosopher and a professor of philosophy. He's also uh, an author, a journalist, um, publishing in Camus' uh, underground newspaper during the Nazi occupation of France. He was a playwright, um, uh, a novelist, uh, an essayist. I mean, he, he was one of the, it, probably he, he you could call him modern society's first public intellectual, where today we have Neil deGrasse Tyson for better and mostly worse. Um, back then you had Sartre and Camus and Simone de Beauvoir, right? Um, and these guys were, were celebrities. They, they uh, took the world and, and not just like the world of, of people having conversations in cafes, but their ideas and, and their... Um, uh, mul the multifarious ways in which they express their ideas through theater and uh, uh, essay and journalism and philosophical um, uh, uh, works um, inspired a whole artistic um, movement, right? So, so you see these existentialist ideas and by extension, uh, similarly liberal and communist Marxist ideas as well get expressed all over. Um, Sartre is uh, a huge inspiration for people like uh, Derrida and Lacan and 
um, these, you know, like new wave psychoanalysts and their deconstructionist project. The, the, uh, Sartre was friends with Foucault, sort of. I think they didn't agree very much, but they at least, uh, agree, well, like, they didn't agree very much philosophically, um, but they were consistent enough um, ideologically to appreciate one another's politics and they would protest together. Um, for the sake of the liberal cause. We could also say that Sartre is probably the, the proper father of existentialism or existentialism proper, right? Um, and one of the only existentialists to accept the moniker uh, his lifelong. Uh, I think Beauvoir called herself an existentialist as well. Uh, Camus did not accept the moniker. He, he said, I'm not an existentialist, though he uses the term to express his ideas. Um, what Sartre is doing in existentialism as a humanism and throughout his career as like the existentialist is something different from what Camus meant to do, though they are very much parallel projects. Um, in 1965, I think it was, maybe 64, uh, Sartre is offered the Nobel Prize for literature um, and turns it down. And he says that, uh, he doesn't want to turn his work into an institution to make himself an institution. He, he would prefer to be, you know, common or whatever, just like everybody else. Um, so it turns it down. Um, during World War II, he was also a war prisoner. And as a young man, he, he was a kid. He was bullied quite a lot. His, his uh, left eye is blind and so would wander and he was made fun of all the time. Um, and I think his father, died when he was very young too. All of the Nietzsche and Kierkegaard too, I think was one of them. Camus, Sartre, all of these guys had their fathers die young. Um, interesting shared quality. Uh, but he was a war prisoner. So he gets captured uh, on the, what would it be, Eastern front of France during the war and uh, is released for medical reasons. And after he's released begins his uh, work for the, the counter-revolution in the underground fighting Vichy France and the Nazi occupation. Um, and his whole life long, he's a man of the people. He wasn't just writing from his ivory tower, sitting, sitting in his great big armchair. He fought for people. He went out into the streets and, um, and protested and uh, made his voice loud to, to help people, to give people the right and power the enfranchisement to express their own will and freedom and power, which is very much uh, in alignment with the existentialist project that we'll see um, as developed in existentialism as a humanism. So he publishes this book in 1946. I think its original name was just existentialism. And it's not actually so much a book as it is a lecture. Um, it's, it's a bunch of lecture notes. Uh, and I don't think he actually wrote it down. I think that uh, it was a uh, transcript of the lecture that he gave. Um, and the, the call for the lecture was um, to express the existentialist ideas and principles to a public audience. So not to students in some lecture series. Uh, for instance, if you read Pragmatism by William James, that was... Uh, in a lecture series given at Harvard, but just for students and professors. This was a public lecture open to the public and they packed the seats all the way back. And um, the, the idea was to vindicate existentialism post-World War II in the eyes of uh, the, the public, the common person and uh, the communists who Sartre uh, wanted to be friends with, right? He wanted his existentialist project to be the communist one. So here's some fun old pictures of uh, Sartre with famous people. At the bottom there's Che Guevara and Sartre and Beauvoir together. Top right is Sartre and Foucault. Foucault has the megaphone. Uh, top left is Sartre and Jean-Luc Godard, the famous director who develops French New Wave film. Um, my favorite of his is Breathless. Um, no, Band Apart. Yeah, Band of Outsiders, Band Apart. Um, that's my favorite Jean-Luc Godard. Breathless is really good too, but Band Apart's the best. On the bottom left, there's Camus playing with a dog while Sartre looks on at the camera. Of course, Camus is playing with a dog. Um, and then Beauvoir and, and Sartre and all of these protesting, right? Just cool moments in 
public intellectual philosophical history. Okay, so how is existentialism is a humanism framed? The idea of the lecture, again, is to vindicate existentialism, to uh, open up its ideas to the public. Um, and what Sartre is doing from the outset is addressing two sets of objections. And I think it's, I, I'm not sure if it's deliberate, but as I read this, I read a whole lot of Plato's apology in this because Plato's apology is also uh, defending himself against two sets of objections, some formal and the others informal, right? If you recall from the apology. Uh, so there's a similar sort of uh, apologetic structure, apologetic meaning like defense of, uh, to existentialism is a humanism and uh, you know Plato's life and, and philosophical method. Um, if it was deliberate, I think it's really clever. And if not, then uh, just convenient. Um, so the first of these objections is that uh, existentialism leads to quietism and despair, meaning that it leads to inaction, non-action, that uh, by, uh, you know, uh, focusing on the absurd and on our uh, thrownness, as Heidegger would say, our abandonedness, our, our uh, despair, anguish, anxiety, nausea, right, um, that so much focus on these negative features of uh, uh, of existentialism and of human life through the lens of existentialism lead us to not overcoming suicide, but to uh, maybe suicide itself, right? To becoming nihilistic, to not having a, a reason or an ability to act at all, just being sort of overcome by uh, the sadness of it all. And we can see this being uh, uh, a particularly acute objection given Camus' publication of The Myth of Sisyphus, huge hit um, throughout France when it was published, um, just before Existentialism as Humanism comes out. And, you know, Camus' sad boy saying that there's one philosophical problem and that's suicide, right? Um, it's kind of dark and it's a little dreadful. And, and of course, it, it makes sense that you would think, well, geez, if that's the case, you know, this living thing might just be really too much after all. Right. So this is one of the charges against the existentialists, and it's mostly um, levied by the communists who are, you know, politicos. They, these are people that want to uh, take action. They want to uh, fight the powers that be, the, the fascists at the time, particularly. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, the USSR and communism gets kind of a bad rap because of all of the like genocide and stuff. Um, at least early on, uh, they were for republicanism, for freedom, um, for personal expression, for the, the common person. And then as the political system develops, things totally go off the rails. So that, you know, when we're using the word communist, especially in like the French uh, political society, um, it's far more the Marxist idealism than uh, Leninism or Stalinism proper, um, which led to you know the uh, in the the most heartfelt and light way you could possibly say this uh, the the genocide and stuff. Um, so uh, that kind of communism probably not so great. Didn't turn out very good uh, for all of the millions of people that um, starved to death. Uh, but at least the, the communism and Marxism that's going around in, in France at this time is the idealistic kind that hasn't had that dark turn quite yet. Okay, so the communists are people of action. They, they want uh, the people to be empowered. They want to uh, withdraw power from the aristocracy, the holdouts of aristocracy um, that had survived uh, the, the post-war period, um, and to give people the ability to express themselves. And if existentialism is so full of uh, dread and despair that people have no reason to act or desire or will or whatsoever to, to get out on the streets and protest and, and make their rights important, then that's a problem. And existentialism is at fault for that problem. So Sartre says, one group after another censors us for overlooking humanity's solidarity and for considering man as an isolated being. This is because we base our doctrine on pure subjectivity, that is, on the Cartesian I think, on the very moment in which man fully comprehends his isolation, rendering us incapable 
of reestablishing solidarity with those who exist outside of the self and are inaccessible through the cogito. And this is a kind of reinterpretation of the problem as a solipsism, right? That if existentialism is starting from this, I think existence precedes essence, which we'll talk about, um, this point of departure for the philosophical system is one that is internal, right? The, the my existence is what is actualized in the world and um, there is self and there's other, right? And so for the communists, the common man, we're all together, right? Um, for the existentialists, it's you first, right? There's no all together, that would be a kind of essence preceding existence. There is just you first. Um, and so what Sartre is going to want to do is make the, the me first consistent with the we first uh, of communism. And the other objection is that existentialism leads to a kind of inhumanism, or that if everyone were to be an existentialist, we would all be strangers in Camus' sense of the stranger Marceau character, right? Everyone would be a stranger to one another. Uh, we'd be roosters to spigots, right? Um, this one made me giggle quite a bit. I liked it. Um, and this is an objection raised by uh, the religious, the, the Catholics, the Jesuits in, in France, um, and everyday normal people, right? So the religious and, and just regular people reading about existentialism and remarking on it. So it's public knowledge that the fundamental approach brought against us is that we stress the dark side of human life. Recently, someone told me about a lady who, after uttering an inadvertent, vulgar expression, excused herself by saying, I think I'm becoming an existentialist. <laughs> right? And, and we see why you might think that, right? That you, you read um, these, these guys talking about anxiety, dread, suicide, sadness, and that this somehow gives us a reason to be. And so uh, you turn it into kind of a slur, the, the existentialist moniker, into kind of a slur that is a catch-all for uh, the anxiety and dread and sadness that people are feeling in the post-war exploded Europe world. So again, the purpose of the public lecture was to vindicate the philosophical school from these very practical object objections. How do we act in the world? And how do we make ourselves consistent with an everyday lifestyle? And Sartre wanted existentialism to help people live better lives. And part of this is political and part of it is anthropological, right? That we need people to be okay as existentialists um, not jumping off buildings. And we also need people to be more than okay to fight for what is right, for what they need and, and all that, right? So it's political as well. So in today's lecture, we'll dig into how Sartre defends existentialism from these objections, while at the same time giving existentialism a very lucid definition. I, I, I think that existentialism as a humanism is a, a very, uh, I mean, as lucid as it gets, uh, depiction of what existentialism is supposed to be all about. Uh, now, Sartre uh, rebukes much of what he says in Existentialism is a Humanism in his later career, uh, gives up on, on a lot of these ideas, but um, at least for an imperfect piece, it, it does its work uh, pretty well. So um, regardless of what Sartre thinks in his later life, in his early career, uh, he produced this work, which is wildly uh, influential and becomes sort of a, a hallmark for all sorts of existentialist quotes um, and uh, idioms and, and, and all this. Basically, like the existentialist ideal is uh, very much expressed in this lecture. So what is existentialism? As Sartre says, it is an idea strictly intended for specialists and philosophers, he says to an audience of lay people and the public. Um, and then the whole goal of giving this lecture and like the conclusion of the argument to come is that this is good for everybody and that you know we can all be communists and you know we the people and, and all that, right? Um, and then he says that existentialism is it, it's misunderstood because it's really only an idea for specialists and philosophers. So here we see a little bit of Sartre's caprice coming in. He, he himself is a bourgeoisie um, and yet is a staunch advocate, right? Like he, he comes from a bourgeois background, um, but doesn't support 
the the lifestyle though he lives it right and i think this is a little bit of that double speak that um you see in in, in um a lot of politicos right where they'll express something and uh mean something else i i think this the sentence might be a little bit of bad faith but you know give it a pass so of existentialists, they're the Christian sort and the atheist or agnostic. And I put a little asterisk there because um, as Sartre says at the end of, of this lecture, um, it doesn't matter whether or not God exists. It wouldn't make any difference to our project because it wouldn't make any difference to uh, being, capital B, right, for being a person. So this might be a kind of strange agnosticism. Um, but of the two categories, there are the Christian existentialists and the atheist existentialists. And we've read all of them. Well, not all of them, but we've read both of these kinds of existentialists in Kierkegaard and Dostoevsky, uh, as well as in Camus, Sartre now, and, and um, uh, Nietzsche. All of these uh, different kinds of existentialists may not share the, uh, a belief in God or faith but what they do share is the common idea that existence precedes essence. And so I've been using this phrase quite a lot throughout the, the summer session um, and uh, given it bits of explanation here, we get the clearest, most straightforward definition from Sartre. So as he says, if we consider a manufactured object such as a paper knife, we note that this object was produced by a craftsman who drew his inspiration from a concept. He referred both to the concept of what a paper knife is and to a known production technique that is a part of that concept and is by and large a formula. The paper knife is thus both an object produced in a certain way and one that on the other hand serves a definite purpose. And so the example here is that the paper knife is an example of an object for whom in essence precedes an existence. And here we have a nice little diagram uh, of the artisan, the person who creates it, who has an idea of a function that they want served. They want to cut an envelope open, right? Um, and they also think of, well, how can I bring this idea into fruition, into reality? How can I make such an object that will easily slice envelopes open? Um, and so you set together your intuitions and ideas and you construct the image of a paper knife its essence, its formula. And so in the act of creating uh, the paper knife, you bring to bear this idea or essence uh, in each step of the, the completion of the formula, the, the running through of it. And uh, at the end, you have your product, the paper knife. And this object deliberately created is there to slice open envelopes. So the question is, um, well, the, the conclusion is that the paper knife's essence precedes its existence. And it could not have come about without first having been an idea or purpose that manifest in the artisan's mind to create that reality, the, the object, uh, to serve the purpose and fulfill the idea of carving open um, envelopes. So here's the question, is a human like a paper knife? It's like an Alice in Wonderland question, right? I just wrote down so they wrote something that popped in my head. So if you you wouldn't believe then in the concept of like destiny and fate then if you believe because that would be like the image. That's exactly right. Yeah. So what Paul asked or said was that you wouldn't, as an existentialist, uh, have a worldview consistent with an idea of destiny or fate, right? Because these and and Sartre denies even determinism, right? Like a, a natural kind of fate, right? Um, uh, necessitarianism, um, because existence precedes essence for the existentialist. This is like the baseline. This um, denies any possibility for there to be, uh, or at least it invalidates the, the, the very idea of like a human nature, right? Um, or of a fate, a reason for which, a, a, a telos of like, being human, a final end, that for the sake of which we are and we act. Um, none of this is out there uh, before we are. That is only through our own existence that uh, we determine the world, uh, that we choose the world that we want to live in, um, in a way that would project such essences onto the world. 
and that's how we express our free will, which we'll get to. Um, but the, 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 there's no, uh, like, there, there's no, um, there's no volcano that we throw the, the ring into and, and that, you know, it was all like writ, written. Um, if we're throwing rings and volcanoes, it's because we brought ourselves to the volcano, not because, uh, you know, the, the fates were pulling those strings. Yeah. Did you have your hand up, Quentin? Yeah. So I was wondering, just along with that, so I'm guessing that doesn't contradict Camus' uh, assertion in the middle of Sisyphus that we all have a fate but instead that the fate that Camus was talking about is more of the human condition that Sartre talks about later in his, his lecture. Would, yeah. Would that be correct? Yeah, so, so we'll cover that too. Um, but it's good to point out now, as long as we're talking about human nature and like essences and stuff, that Sartre is gonna distinguish between the human condition and human nature, where human nature is like this Or, uh, you know, it'd be like the, the image of man created, you know, in the image of God, um, or of there being like some destiny out there, you know, the, the stars align. And so they cause us to, you know, be Virgos and Capricorns and Sagittari Sagittarii, Sagittariuses. Um, it be like something we want to do versus something we're meant to do. Yeah, there's no such thing as meant to do, at least not in the sense of like strict causal force meant to. You might apply meant to as a sort of like pragmatic force to the way in which you're willing, right? The way in which you're deciding to do what you do uh, that maybe imagining or thinking that uh, you meant to as long as it's with the right sort of uh, epistemic humility that that could be consistent with the existentialist project as well, that uh, you don't have to completely rid yourself of like subjunctive normative language. Um, but there is a distinction to be made between nature and condition, where our condition is that we're all condemned to be free and that's just what we are, but our being condemned to freedom is not a uh, forward looking, uh, sort of destiny or future, right? It's not a human nature. There's no like value that, that we uh, exhibit insofar as we have this shared condition. Um, rather, uh, it just is what we are. So uh, you, you might think of uh, destiny as something that pulls you and a condition as a sort of starting point uh, that could go in any direction. And that's what's universal. So if this, this was published, you said, right after the end of the Second World War. So like, how would he think of like the concept of basic human rights, so seeing like the atrocities of World War II and the Nazis, like how would someone with this frame of like look at that? Would they look at it as something that exists? Like, do would he feel even that people have basic human rights, or are we all just people that and we get to choose for ourselves what that looks like? Yes, yeah. Um, so we all get to choose what that looks like for us, but there is a very particular way in which we can choose what is good for us authentically in good faith, not in bad faith. And that is to will freedom, which is where he gets to at the end of the lecture. Um, and, and we will as well. Uh, so it's good to, I suppose, preamble all this because then it'll you know, click when, we, when we get there. When you, see, you see yourself and do that in conjunction with seeing someone else. Yeah, exactly. So, so the idea here is that um, existence preceding essence uh, condemns us to be free and uh, it uh, removes our ability to attribute responsibility for our actions to uh, things like destiny or fate or God's will or whatever, right? Um, it's all up to us. But the way that we do well together, not just uh, capriciously deciding what we want to, um, is to will freedom. And this is where you get the overlap with communism, right? The, where you get, you don't get human rights because there is like human nature that we need to protect, but you get human rights because there's a condition that uh, is not great, but we can make it work, right? And we can also break it. Um, and that'll be at the very end of lecture that, that we get there. But, but this is all good. This all falls out of existence precedes essence because this is the starting point for existentialism.
So is a human like a paper knife? Theistic thinkers would say so, right? That man is created in the image of God. And even if not in like the image of, then at least it's preceded by um, the divine intellect, right? So um, in very much theistic philosophy, there is this idea of the divine will and the divine intellect being two different things. And some thinkers combine them. Um, but the idea is that the divine intellect is just that which peers over. It's like the omniscience and the divine will is the omnipotence. And we can separate these two powers. And it's only in separating the two powers that we can say that like God has a free will at all. This is Leibniz. Um, but even if uh, we're not created in the image of, then the divine intellect insofar as it's omniscient um, has the concept in you know, God's head, kind of a head in the divine intellect, like the artisan has of um, the paper knife, right? Um, and this is where you get intelligent design, right? And even atheistic thinkers have argued so much, which is like human nature or universality, right? That as soon as you say that uh, all humans are due basic rights because you're human, you've posited a human nature, you've posited a kind of essence uh, which precedes existence. Um, and this, according to the existentialists, is a mistake. Because to be is to exist. If God does not exist, there's at least one being in whom existence precedes essence, a being whose existence comes before its essence, a being who exists before he can be defined by any concept of it. And that being is man, or as Heidegger put it, the human reality. And here, I, I think this is like an interesting little side note, a, a neat tangent to distinguish the being from the experience of the being, right? So, so if, if Sartre is uncareful, he says the being for whom existence precedes essence is humankind, right? And this is almost a kind of essentialism to say that to be human is essentially to be that for whom existence precedes essence. And that seems to be viciously circular. Um, you've, you've just, you know, uh, argued yourself into a very problematic position. But if we shift the name of the game from an essentialism about humankind to the quality of human experience or the human reality, this is what Heidegger talks about. He tries to construct, he does construct an ontology of absorbed experience, just like our everyday of living, the stuff that we don't think about, but we just sort of do and interact with the world. It just happens. Um, that's the human reality. That's the existence stuff. There's not like humankind and then humankind exists, but there's just the human quality of existence, the human reality. So to be is to exist and existence uh, we perceive. And in perceiving, we encounter ourselves, right? So there's existence. There's not a concept of self prior to existence. There just is the human reality that is currently, you know, that my body is currently inhabiting. Um, and through perception, I encounter myself. And this moment of encountering is an odd one and, and distinctly human. Um, and if not distinctly human, then uh, inspired by humanity often like i can think of like pets and stuff that you know have a little bit of self-actualization some strange anxiety from looking in a mirror or whatever um so when we encounter ourselves we experience ourselves as existing and as being in two separate ways and when we encounter ourselves we also experience ourselves as sep as a separate intellectual entity that reflectively looks down upon that existing being as such Right. So there is the, the reality of, of existence. And then there is this reflective stance that we take when we perceive the being uh, whom we are that is existing. Right. And the distance between these is what causes nausea, according to Sartre. Right. That, um, that there you are. And yet you're out here kind of thinking about yourself. You, the, you only have essentialisms with which to conceive of your world and your existence, though recognizing that all of those essentialisms are derivative of the existence itself. And so there's this separation in the encountering of oneself that leads to Heideggerian anxiety or nausea for Sartre. So we are both the artisan and the art, right? That if, if in encountering ourselves, 
what we do is we impose essentialisms, the ideas, here's what I ought to be, what I am meant to do, what I should do, et cetera, right? That we're directing ourselves. And yet in directing ourselves, we further the human reality from which we can derive these essentialisms to continue to um, move ourselves. So if man, as existential, if man as existentialists conceive of him cannot be defined, it is because to begin with, he is nothing. He will not be anything until later, and then he will be what he makes of himself. Thus, there is no human nature since there is no God to conceive of it. Man is not only that which he wills himself to be, and since he conceives of himself only after he exists, just as he wills himself to be after being thrown into existence, man is nothing other than what he makes of himself. This is the first principle of existentialism. Here we have existence preceding essence. Um, before I move on, any questions about existence precedes essence? A quick one, hopefully. And, uh, but you kind of alluded to this when you were talking about pets and such. But when we think about the idea of evolution and us having descended from some other being that perhaps isn't uh, aware of themselves, hasn't encountered themselves. Does that mean, like, if, if Sartre accepts uh, evolution, then he also believes that at some point there was a losing of um, essence preceding existence and it swapped when there was this encounter of the self? I have no idea what Sartre would say about natural science and evolution. I suspect that what he would say is that for any natural being, existence precedes essence. And, and what he's doing is saying, there's at least one, right? We had that quote. There's at least one and that is humankind, right? Um, and that's enough to like, move his project forward and like get the political ends uh, satisfied that he wants to satisfy. Uh, I think it's a, an interesting thought worth developing as like a paper topic or in the future or whatever. Um, how does the exist, how, how far down does existence precede essence run? And just like off the top of my head, intuition says all the way, if it's living, then there is experience and then from experience is derived. But like a jellyfish, right? Total instinct. It's just floating. It seems a lot more like a paper knife than a, a human. Well, it's it's not made. What well, assuming there is no god that like creates it and puts it there, right? Some like uh, even an evil genius, whatever, right? Like some greater power. Um, then it is just an existence, and to itself has no essence. There's there is just its reality, raw and bare. And for us, it's not quite as raw and bare because we flip out and encounter ourselves. Um, and then flip out and nausea, right? Okay, cool question. So radical freedom, if existence precedes essence, um, what does this mean for how we act? If exist, it, and so Sartre answers, if existence truly precedes essence, man is responsible for what he is. Thus the first effect of existentialism is to make every man conscious of what he is and to make him solely responsible for his own existence. And when we say that man is responsible for himself, we do not mean that he is responsible only for his own individuality, but that he, was re he is responsible for all men. In choosing for himself, he chooses for all men. And this is going to be the, the crux upon which the existentialist project, as Sartre envisions it, uh, turns, right? This, this is the touchstone, is this idea of radical freedom. And I don't think he, he, he doesn't use the term radical freedom here, but he does in other works. This is like the the, the jargon term for it. Um, so radical, radical freedom is just the idea that if everything is permissible, right, in this uh, Ivan Karamazov way, then we are entirely responsible for what we do. Everything is open to us. As, as far as the limits of the human will can extend, that is the, the limit of possibility for what we can choose to do, what we can do at all. And we're not merely responsible for what we choose to do, what's within the power of our will in our own person. That responsibility is not merely internal, but it's external as well. It's universal, in fact. So insofar as we will to do some act, we are responsible for the sanctioning of that act 
to the entire human race for all human history. Um, insofar as I do X, I say that for humankind, for whom there is no essence to precede existence, for the human reality, it is okay to do X. And because we all share in the same human condition, uh, any act that we perform is one that uh, it legislates universally for better and for worse. So if an existence where humans make themselves through action, uh, the only morality is that which we set forth through our acts. There's no uh, you know, God's plan for the existentialist. There's no uh, Kant's categorical imperative. Well, this sounds pretty similar inspired by at least. Um, and there's no you know, uh, eudaimonia to guide our actions. We decide it, we make it, right? Insofar as we exist, we create through our actions and we can create uh, paper knives just as well as we can create moralities as well. And this is why actions legislate universally by declaring this is what ought to be done. In this particular situation, given all of the, the experience that I have, insofar as I choose to do X, this, it, anybody else in my situation should also choose to do X. And this leads us into anguish. Radical freedom does, right? And it's, it's not that like, oh, I, 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 just, I just chose something, I'm in anguish. No, it's, it's the realization, right? So at the realization that we're radically free and universally responsible, life gets much weightier. All of our choices, we're now legislating universally to all human history and, and all humankind saying, I have done this, I'm responsible for it, and I accept responsibility for its, uh, that, that action's uh, uh, normativity for all humankind. That, that's weighty, right? That, that's some heavy stuff. So everything I choose to do, says the person in anguish, I must be able to universally affirm, which sounds very much like Nietzsche, or otherwise to turn away from in bad faith to be inauthentic, which would be in Camus terms to commit philosophical suicide. So I have a choice, maybe a, there, there's, there's a, a problematic setup here, right? That either I affirm everything universally or I turn away from it. I act in bad faith uh, and we'll get an argument against bad faith uh, here in a bit. But what would happen if everyone did what I'm doing? This is the big question. Right. If if I act in this way, I must think to myself, what if everybody did this? And this sounds very much like the Kantian categorical imperative, which uh, the first formulation is uh, always act such that the maxim of your action uh, may be consistent with uh, the always act such that the. Uh, maximum of your action always treats others not only as means but always at the same time as ends in themselves i think that's the second formulation though it's the first one um always act such that the maximum of your action could be willed to be a universal law that's it so the first it uh, the first categorical imperative says uh make sure that what you're doing could be willed as a universal law so for instance if you steal a car imagine a world in which everybody stole cars it, it wouldn't work or uh, imagine uh, if you lied and then a world in which everybody lied all the time, communication would be impossible, right? There'd be no, you, you have to like trust that people are telling the truth in order for communication to work. So this is the, the Kantian categorical imperative. And Sartre gives us a version of it here. Imagine what would it be like if everybody did what I'm doing? And so far as I, I act, I will, and I legislate through my will universally, right? Um, Sartre, I don't think means to make this claim an imperative like Kant does. For Kant, the, the, the freedom of the will uh, is rationally expressed by doing one's duty, which is consistent with the categorical imperative. So this is a kind of a essence preceding existence. There's a human nature that we have that leads us to uh, rationally be required to act in this way. Sartre, this is not the case. Sartre, it's sort of the other way around, even though there is kind of a, a categorical sense to the, the way in which we will and how, our will, how we're radically free and responsible for what we will, which is just to say that um, the, the imperative isn't there before, but insofar as we act, we need to act as if 
there were some sort of imperative insofar as we choose to do that, right? So what if the imperative became what I am asking, right? What, th th there's no such thing as uh, a rational nature that compels me through uh, an expression of freedom to do my duty. But if I'm acting in this way, what if there were such uh, uh, a categorical imperative? Um, would that be something worth legislating universally to all of humankind? So if we turn away, if we don't accept the radical responsibility, the radical freedom that we have, the, the openness of our will to do anything and to be responsible for everything, um, we can act in bad faith. So Iago in Othello uh, convinces Othello that uh, his, uh, was it Cassio? And I can't remember Othello's wife's name. Um, that they're like having an affair. And so Othello kills everybody and uh, Iago giggles to himself on the side. Um, Iago is a trickster and, and lying to, to uh, Othello's face and playing the, the victim. Oh, what was me? I'm so sad this is happening when he wants all chaos to ensue, right? Um, you could also imagine an instance of bad faith to be waving the white flag to your, to your enemy in the trench. And uh, when they come to uh, you know, accept your surrender, you pull out your rifle and you shoot them. This is acting in bad faith. Um, and I gave the example in our very first lecture of Pierre the Cynic Waiter who uh, treats you like the lovely customer, but um, absolutely hates the fact that you wore flip-flops into uh, a five-star Zagat rated restaurant. Oops. So, Definition in short of bad faith is just to deliberately act in ways that are contrary to your true principles or intentions. So if you recognize that existence precedes essence, then, says Sartre, you recognize that you're radically free and then to act in such a way that isn't consistent with um, this uh, radical freedom is to be in bad faith and to escape anguish because the anguish is, wow, everything I do is really weighty and important. Um, but if I just kind of forget about that for a while, look the other way, then maybe I don't have to feel so anguished. And it's not, bad faith is not an ocracia. It's not a weakness of the will because a weakness of the will, uh, ocracy is like texting and driving. You know that you shouldn't text and drive and you do it anyways. Don't text, Desdemona, thank you, sir. Um, you, you text anyways, don't do this because you'll kill people or yourself or both. And that's really bad. Um, so weakness of the will is, is, is knowing that texting and driving is bad, but you do it anyways. Um, acting in bad faith is, is deliberate and your will is expressing itself, right? It's uh, knowing that you're acting contrary to your actual principles. Um, you're, you're willfully being what Sartre calls a coward or a bastard, right? Um, as opposed to the weakness of will, which you're not quite as responsible for. You're still responsible, but not quite in the same way as acting in bad faith. So for Abraham, for instance, the anguish is in deciding if the voice of the angel is real or if it actually communicates the will of God. You know, he's about to drop the knife into his son's chest and an angel comes, but is that who we should listen to in this moment? Can he be turned away? And he has to decide even, even with the will of God behind him, almost pushing the knife down. Uh, he has to be the one to decide, do I follow through or do I accept the, the word of this you know, semi-divine creature and uh, give up on the sacrifice? And, and that choice is one of anguish, right? It's one in which he is alone in deciding what to do next. There's no one telling him what to do. There's no reason for him to decide one way or another what's right or what's wrong. All he has is what he has in that moment and decides to put down the knife. Turns out that that was the right choice. Um, but think of that painting from our lecture on uh, the, the Binding of Isaac and, and, and the, the pain in Abraham's face. That's the anguish that he's experiencing in that moment the anguish of the weightiness of his will and the requirement that uh, he make a choice. Uh, Sarah. 
Um, how do you distinguish the acrasia from the the bad faith in light of like the butterfly effect kind of idea that, um, I mean, so, I don't know, so many things that we do uh, do have such impacts uh, on others or can be used by others if they take us in, as an example. And we're supposed to, through existentialism, really count on um, responsibility for people taking us as an example, right? And I mean, how do we not get carried away <laughs> with the bad faith, the crassia, uh, you know, where everything becomes bad faith and the anguish becomes overwhelming, for instance? Um, I think that there's there's probably cases to be made for overlaps in ocracia and, and bad faith, um, like the, the one that you're making here, uh, though they are different concepts. So, so the reason I distinguish them is just to say that one is deliberately willful and the other is uh, more like, a, like weakness of will, right? Um, and I think there are ways in which we can deliberately be weak to uh, our will, right? Where we can just say, I, I'm going to be lazy. I, I don't care. When you really actually do um, care, right? Um, and so, so there's, there, there's not a, a strict distinction to be made, just like you know, the, the concepts do come apart. So maybe as you become aware, like as you, for instance, uh, like awaken, to certain things, then your response, your, your, it becomes more of a, a point of bad faith. For instance, if somebody wasn't aware of something and became, they, it might be a crustia, I don't know, so I'm saying that right. And then once they become aware of it, then it's, it's a matter of, of bad faith, whether they choose to look away or not, because it's yeah. based on your awareness, uh, that kind of. Uh, yeah, so so absolutely. So, so there's a distinction to be made between ignorance and meta-ignorance, right? Where ignorance is you had every reason to know that, you know, people of different uh, skin colors are all still people. And we live in a world where, you know, you can't just be a product of your times anymore. Um, and yet you're still a prejudiced asshole, right? A bastard. Um, and then there's meta-ignorance where you didn't have any of those social tools and lessons just sort of presently available to you everywhere. Say like you grew up in a, a, a tub underground or something, uh, and then you came up above ground and you had all sorts of strange, weird views, but you didn't have the tools to know like what was right and what was wrong and what was good or what was bad. This is meta ignorance, right? And so you might say that, um, uh, the the things for which you're ignorant, um, you uh, are acting in bad faith when you act in prejudice out of ignorance. Uh, but it's not quite bad faith when you're acting out of prejudice in um, meta ignorance because it, it's not like really pernicious prejudice, or it may not even be prejudice at all. Because Yeah. I mean, to call someone prejudice or ignorance based on something that is deemed to be a universal truth, which would be this. Yeah. And, and so you get like the Camus quote that's consistent with this idea, right? That um, everyone is equal in the absurd, that, that the, the tables are completely level. Um, and uh, again, th this is an idea consistent with a, a Marxism or a communism where the tables are politically level as well, not just at the level of human condition, but at the level of like human reality in a political world with one another. Um, and, and yeah, so, so there's uh, bad faith in our political world as well when we act with prejudice saying that some of us are better than others of us. The uh, whiter of us are better than the browner of us, or the richer of us are better than the poorer of us, right? These are like prejudices that are incredibly both explicitly and implicitly rampant in our world, um, especially in American society, right? Um, and these are the, the sorts of prejudices that the existentialists are trying to wash away um, with their, you know, uh, expressions of absurd and of anguish and dread and all this. 
um, while also making the political reality possible. Cool. Okay, so let's let's carry on here. Um, so does dread or does this anguish lead us to inaction? This is the the real question. This is the the objection that. Um, Sartre is trying to respond to, um, okay, the existentialist says that we're all radically free, that we're all equal, and uh, that everything is absurd and awful, and uh, oh no, everything is really hard, and I now need to think a lot about why and how not to kill myself. Um, what if I just didn't, right? Couldn't I just uh, not do anything? Well, no, says Sartre that this is not a doctrine of inaction or quietism. The anguish we are concerned with here is not the kind that could lead to quietism or inaction. It is anguish, pure and simple, of the kind experienced by all who have borne responsibilities. To the contrary, angu anguish is the very condition of their action, for they first contemplate several options, and in choosing one of them, realize that its only value lies in the fact that it was chosen. It is not a screen that separates us from action, but a condition of action itself. So for instance, um, you are forced to choose to pull a trolley lever or not. If you pull it, then the track moves and it goes from where it would hit five people to only hitting one person. This is a choice that you must make and not choosing is still kind of a choice. It, it is a choice. Um, the Catholics would call it sin by omission. If you know, the sin is a choice, but the, it, it is still a choice to, to pull the lever or not. You are in the position to do it and you bear the responsibility for not doing it and there being five deaths or doing it and there being one death. Uh, and no matter what you do, someone's going to die or some people are going to die. And this causes anguish, the responsibility that you bear. And it's not the fact that like someone's going to die that causes anguish. It's that you bear the responsibility for the consequences of the choice, no matter what it ends up being. This is the anguish. The, the fact that like sometimes people die from our choices that like, or bad things happen or whatever, this comes later, right? This is like the third consequence of existentialism. But for now, it's just the fact that we bear the responsibility of the consequences of our choice or of our not choosing, which is itself a kind of choice that leads us into anguish. And so anguish isn't a kind of inaction, but a comorbid or coexistent quality of action. And to say that the anguish of responsibility leads us to inaction is a mistake, right? It's to say that um, it leads you to a position that is impossible for the existentialist, because all there is to do is to act. And if this is the case, then the next consequence is abandonment. If God does not exist, man is consequently abandoned, for he cannot find anything to rely on within or without, right? Existence precedes essence, and at first we are nothing until we encounter ourselves. There are no excuses, says Sartre, unforgiving. We will encounter no values or orders that can legitimize our conduct. We are left alone and without excuse. That is what I mean when I say that man is condemned to be free, condemned because he did not create himself yet nonetheless free because once cast into the world, he, was, he is responsible for everything he does. We are abandoned. There's no rhyme or reason before us to tell us why or what we should do. We got to make that all up ourselves. And that abandonment doesn't feel so good. So here's an example that he gives of abandonment and of anguish too. One of Sartre's students is made to choose between joining the free French forces in, in Britain or trying to, it was tough to get across enemy lines and through France and across the channel, right? It's a whole odyssey doing it. Or taking care of his mother. His country is under Nazi control, right? His father and brother are dead and he's all his mother has. Should he try to join the French forces and leave his mother to die of grief? Because surely if he leaves, then she'll suffer and die alone. Or should he protect his future, his ideals, and his country at the cost of his family? Does he choose the riskier and less effective single body in an army uh, for the sake of these higher principles? Or does he choose the closer at home, smaller gain, the, the lesser good, but the more immediate one, the one?
We've lost audio. Hello. Hello. Oh. We can hear you now. After you said the more immediate one, it, it went out. Hello, can you hear me? Okay, so my mic died. So we'll just have to use the laptop um, for now. So I'll just use this. Okay, so back with audio. Um, his choice is to choose the uh, immediate good that he knows will uh, be successful because he knows that by staying with his mother, she won't die of grief and he'll do well. But um, you know, uh, uh, act contrary to his political and, and personal values to see his countrymen uh, die and suffer without his help? Um, or uh, should he actually go and, and you know, be one of uh, countrymen among many, right? So Sartre says he was vacillating, the student, was vacillating between two kinds of morality, a morality motivated by sympathy and individual devotion, and another morality with a broader scope, but less likely to be fruitful. He had to choose between the two. And no code of ethics or moral system evaluation is able to make the right choice for the student. Any moral maxim will give vague advice to do good and how to do good, but there's good in both options, right? And this is the abandonment that um, does, if, if I follow, the, if I do what a Christian would do, you know, WWJD, if I do what Jesus would do, what would Jesus do? It's very unclear. Um, what would Kant tell me to do with the categorical imperative? Also very unclear. Everyone should join to protect their uh, homeland from you know, fascist Nazis. And also uh, everyone should uh, not let their family, their mothers die of grief by abandoning them, right? That there's no external moral system, valuation, human nature, essence. There's nothing out there that can guide you through a moral dilemma like this. There's nothing. There's nothing you can lean on or rely on. There are no excuses. You are responsible for the choice that you make and you will do harm and you will do good no matter what you choose or do not choose. You're responsible. So how does the student make his choice? Well, all he has to make his decision is his feeling, his passion. He feels like one course of action is superior to the other. He feels like being with his mother is what he ought to do. And so declares that it is what he should do, what is right to do by acting upon it. And again, anguish, right? That uh, what he does in being completely responsible for his choices, he's legislating universally that you know, it's okay to stay with your mother in this situation, knowing at the same time that this universal legislation is to forsake his countrymen, the free French forces fighting against the Nazi regime. And he has to bear the responsibility for that universal legislation. This is the anguish and the abandonment uh, that entails it. His will is his own. His choice is universally legislative. And by deciding in one way or another, he bears the full responsibility for his choice. He can't say God or Kant made me do it. He made him do it. He decided it. So here's what I was thinking as I was reading this. What do you guys think? Is passion, right? This like intuition, feeling, whatever it is. Is that all that compels our actions? How do we understand what that is supposed to be? The, the feeling that inspires us to act in one way or another. What part of the human reality does the feeling that compels make up? Like what we want to do, like our desires, basically. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, you can reason just as well as passion, and you can reason with either one and find either more reasonable instead of passion to decide. I, I think he, he mentions that where he talks about logic versus, I'm not sure if he's using passion or what he says, but I mean, I don't think it's all that compels our, our actions is, is passion. You can use other tools, but like you said, I mean, none of them are complete. And it, that's just something you have to live with. 
bear the responsibility for the incompleteness of our tools to help us decide. Now, Sartre does object to using of other tools, like with the Abraham thing. He says, how, how do you know that you're you? How do you know that the voice in your head, like if you're, if you're schizoaffective, right, and you have a voice speaking to you, how do you not, how do you tell the difference between that and another voice? Right. And how do you know that you're not actually a prophet of God, right? Because you may very well be, and it's up to something at bottom to make the choice one way or another that, that um, the voice is real or is not. Um, that in Abraham's case, it was, and thank God he didn't yeah. fall the The arena night. also determines a lot. The arena of which you're making the decision. The arena in which you're making the decision? Yeah, what do like you mean? Like a business decision, for example. You know, if you, have, if you are running a business and you have to fire someone, mm -hmm. it's not a decision that feels good. And you know the ripple effects it's going to have on their financial well-being, their family, lots of different things. But that's mm -hmm. why the phrase, you know, it's not personal. It's business, you know, because mm -hmm. you have to put the needs of this over the needs of the individual. That's not an emotion or a passionate decision right. at all. I mean, that's like completely logical. Like saying that this person did a poor thing here that affected the business poorly. So now I'm going to remove their livelihood and their ability to feed their family. There's no, that's, if it was that emotion, they wouldn't be able to do it. Yeah. So you can't picture those things. Like you have to be able to remove emotion completely from the package and only do it based on logic. On the other hand, too, you could just say well-being, right? You could put that above business and say, well, what do I want to make yep. me feel the most comfortable 100%. and not have to, you know, deal with even more dreadful emotions? You know, what, and there's what people that operate like that in the yeah. business realm, 100%. Like, yeah. I, you know, you, you deal with people who clearly don't have the skills or the capabilities. And it's like, oh, who do they know? What did they do? You know, who's afraid to let them go? Or whatever. There's lots of like, or relationships, you know, like breaking up with somebody, like that's mm -hmm. difficult, that's hard, and if you don't want to be the bad guy, you're like, I'll just deal with it, you know. But it's yeah. it's it's not you, it's, it's me. It's not yeah. exactly. Yeah. So it's yeah. there's. I think that's why there's a different arenas. And like so, the, the example he used it was an interesting one because it was like the well-being. Because to me, it's like the well-being of my mother would far outweigh like fighting for a cause. But that's just me. To yeah. someone else, it might be the complete opposite. Mm -hmm. yeah. To Camus, it would be would it be the opposite? Fighting for a cause would be more. I mean, than his mother. I mean, so every, no, no, it's just all the same. He just smoked a cigarette and not worry about it. But <laughs> it'd be his mother. Yeah. So you know, some people would be the opposite. You know, they could care less. I mean, it's all about the cause. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting the the arena in which you're in. I, I like that idea. You guys caught all that, right? Online. Yes. Did you? Yeah, it was great. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I think that's that's an interesting idea that depending on the circumstance that you're in, it changes the um, the the moving principle of your will, or at least how the will is moved. And I, so, so what I'm thinking right now is like, is it possible to make this idea of like feeling consistent with the uh, it, it's it's not you, it's me, that it's just business kind of thing. Um, it, and I, th I think maybe, but it, it is going to look strange. So for instance, um, you could say that, well, should I fire this person or not, um, ends up coming down to a feeling too. Um, you just don't treat it passionately, the, the, the act, right? Um, the feeling is just that my business is going to fail if I don't. Uh, do this. And so I feel like I need to. Um, and you can reason your way all the way to the point where there's no other choice, but but then that final moment of will is one of feeling maybe. I think it also speaks to the human condition versus human nature, because if it was human nature, we should theoretically all feel the same the same way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Whereas we don't. Like we yeah. all have different beliefs of what we're passionate about, what we attach value to ideals yeah our ideals are what are you know worths things of that nature where if there was a human nature and i think you see that a lot today there's people that believe that we should all feel the same about certain things and we clearly don't and so <laughs> yeah it's, it's that's where people you know you have a lot of head butting over that but i think it proves the point is that the, the power of the human condition versus versus the nature cool may, sarah may I, I saw your hand up yeah, just um, I like what was just said about um, 
the human condition versus human nature, just thinking that the body of your life experience of your lived experience, that can become an informative kind of body of work where I can see just the body of your life experience, um, maybe, maybe choosing the mother, for instance, over the cause, you're making a choice for what is more individual and particular in your contribution rather than what is more general. Mm -hmm. And the body of your life experience might, I mean, the individuality is an important feature, I think, of, of what's important to a person and what they have to contribute. And maybe, you know, no one else is going to take care of his mother, whereas other people, although he could have made either choice, other people could potentially serve in that cause. But if everyone abandons their mothers when that's the, you're the one person who could care for them, maybe part of your life experience with these relationships and the people who come in your path, maybe part of your value might be in being very particular about what you can offer rather than just making yourself a universal example to all. Um, I, don't know, I think the individuality part is important and there's something to be said for your particular contribution you can make that's specific to you, that's unique. Like maybe so, Picasso could have been a good mechanic, but he also could have only maybe been, maybe he could only have been at Picasso. With the, you know. the, the big example in philosophy is Gauguin who like abandons his family to go become a famous painter, mm. right? Um, is that, is it Gauguin? I think so. El Greco? <laughs> I think it's Kogan who he abandons his family to become a famous painter um, and, you know, like makes really famous works of art. So was it worth it, you know, leaving his wife and few kids to live impoverished? Um, but I think what you're bringing up is an, another interesting point, similar to the it's just business or it's not you, it's me. Um, but the, uh, how did you phrase it? The sum of our life experiences. Um, what I was thinking there was, you might be right that there's like a snowball effect in what we do and how we live our lives. And it's not so much ourselves that moves the force in the direction that it does as it is the like rolled weight and momentum of the the groove that we've been rolling in, right? The also, snowball yeah, halfway down the hill. Environment too, you know, because if you're in an environment that attaches values to certain things, right? mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Like if I grow up in a family that is really about family, and he grows up in a family that's not, yeah, and he's not going to probably choose the mother route, whereas I would, yeah, you know, because we don't have. I don't. I grew up with that importance. You right. see it a lot with like our society, like American society versus other cultures, like in other countries, like we treat it differently. You saw it during COVID, but other uh, ethnic groups have multi multi um, you know, older relatives live in within the same, like in Italy and New England. Mm, yeah, COVID first started, their numbers were so high because it was multi generational households. America's not like that, and so like they have different family values over there than we do, and so all these choices would go different ways. So I wonder if from this from this idea that we've been talking about that the sum of our life experiences can kind of create our ideals or our preferences mm -hmm. in a certain moment. If maybe from that, we could get Camus' um, ethic of quantity, that if we are living more life, then we have a better idea of what our values should be, you know? Well, a better, um, a better, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like uh, knowledge base to pull from. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, and, and maybe with a wider quantity of experience, you don't have such a directive force leading you like in one yeah. way that you can be a little more sensitive. Um, so I, this is all really interesting. Um, and and I, I like the, the thought of it, especially how it's consistent with, with Camus um, because these two are, you know, they, they end up being inconsistent, but at least they're like working in parallel quite early on. Um, I wonder whether the 
body of life experiences having like a snowball effect and guiding us towards our actions as an alternative to this like feeling and passion thing or maybe that that's just what feeling and passion is right um if that's not a kind of bad faith right or a sort of philosophical suicide that it's a turning away from that i've always been this way and so i will continue to be this way what you're doing is you're putting an essence behind yourself contingently not necessarily but contingently and then allowing that to be what moves you forward um this it, it's unclear. I mean, that it just this isn't a case that Sartre talks about or Camus, yeah. um, but that could be a potential problem with, with this idea as well. Um, though, like not not a problem in the sense that like um, we're thinking about it wrong, but a problem for these guys. So yeah, really cool discussion. Well, he says in here, doesn't he, that where you can't use what happens to you as a reason why you don't do stuff. Mm -hmm. So in theory, then he would would he object to saying that you could use it to why you do do stuff? If you can't use it as a crux, then you can't use it as a motivation either. There are no excuses. So as long as you're able to be responsible for and accept responsibility for, as long as you do accept responsibility for, um, then you're acting authentically in good faith, and then that would work. So as long as it's informing you of what you're going to be responsible for, then, it, then your experience is healthy. So I'm going to go to the chat. Abby says, I think more than desire, almost like an internal sensory experience, almost a texture, maybe like a climate. Yeah, that, which is similar to what Paul has said, like the arena that you're in, right? The climate, the texture, that, that's it's a cool way of putting it. It's elusive and ambiguous. Uh, and Corna says, I think this conversation might also contradict Sartre's idea of true freedom. Without God, there's no plan, yet there are still circumstances and experiences that shape us to make certain choices, a kind of determinism. Yeah, so, so Sartre denies determinism for no principled reason. Or, well, I mean, like all of what he's saying is the principled reason, but I mean, it's not like a direct argument against determinism. He just says, there's no such thing. Um, yeah, so, so the, the like working of life experience, the arena that we're in, all of this is to externalize the forces of will that compel us or guide us to act in particular ways. Mm -hmm. Um, so think like in the, the prejudiced meta ignorance case, right. Where someone is, is being racist, but they, they were never like taught that, you know, people are actually not so different and that, you know, like it's not a, an appropriate way to treat others, right. That, that they're meta ignorant, um, that, uh, these are external forces, like the, the product of their environment, right. That's guiding their will to, to be in the certain, to, to actualize itself in the way that it, it will, which is through prejudice, not great. Um, I, I get the sense that this, even this like meta ignorantly prejudiced person it, is able to act consistently with Sartre's program um, because they can act that way in good faith. That there's nothing that they, need realize in order to um, say, wait, maybe I shouldn't act this way because they're meta ignorant, right? So it's it's possible for this person to, um, to accept responsibility for the way that they're acting and be like, cool with it, even though they're like missing the right information that would help clear things up here. So there are external forces on our will that Sartre just doesn't seem to address here, yeah. for sure. And so, Corner, I think you're right to, to point out that this is, if it's not a determinism, because it's a really strong term, it just says we don't have the power to do otherwise, then at least it's, it's like a deep influence that is troubling for a philosophical move that requires incredibly robust libertarian free will, right? Yeah. Meaning, like, we have all of the, the field of possible choices before us, and we have all of the, the internal constructive power within us to make one of those choices happen and it's us when we do it it's it's unclear um how this liberal or, or um, libertarian free will is consistent with an idea like freedom with the student who uh chooses to um especially if there's no human nature I mean, yeah if especially you, if, there's if, you, if you took two people in the if you grow up with somebody who's constantly saying the same thing mm -hmm. and there's no concept of human nature, it would be impossible for them to grow up there and not come out with those same ideas. Mm -hmm. 
this. Exactly. And that's all you're exposed to. Yeah. No so way. how much of that is really personal responsibility and how much of that is um, personhood, the self encountering itself and then willing uh, authentically and how much of that is uh, the wool being pulled over your eyes by society and, and the world? Right. Interesting question and, and certainly a problem here um, and for anyone who posits libertarian free will. But um, let's, let's move on. So that, that's good discussion. Thank you guys for your comments. Really cool. Um, we'll have one more of those as we go forward. So after we have been, we recognize our abandonment, we uh, are placed in the position of uh, radical responsibility, radical freedom. Uh, we have uh, anguish and yet we act anyways, right? Because this is not a philosophy of inaction. We recognize that man is nothing other than his own project. He exists only to the extent that he realizes himself. Therefore, he is nothing more than the sum of his actions, nothing more than his life. And so maybe in these cases where we recognize that we can only be the sum of our actions and those actions may not be entirely ours and they're probably not always going to be successful, we fall into despair. This is what despair is. Despair is uh, to recognize that all of life is choice and a matter of probability. What we think is good or what we think is bad um, is influenced by the world we're a part of, that we're brought up in, um, and what we decide to do uh, may not always turn out the good that we hope it will. Um, for all of our best intentions, we can still we can still fail. For all the best laid plans of mice and men, right? They all go awry. In a life, a man commits himself and draws his own portrait, outside of which there's nothing. Uh, but we don't always get to control the paint that we're given or the canvas upon which the portrait is to be wrote. In light of all this, Sartre says, what people reproach us for, existentialists, is not essentially our pessimism, but the sternness of our optimism. There are no excuses. So act, be free, be yourself, be you, just do you. Um, and, and you get, I, I get it. I get the sternness of optimism looking a lot like a kind of cynicism or a kind of pessimism, but only from a weakened or impoverished, uh, uncharitable perspective. From the perspective of the existentialists, they're not being cynics. They are actually sternly optimistic. Um, and they, they accept the despair that comes with the uh, failure inherent in the necessity, the, the condemnation, right? We're condemned to be free. The condemnation to make free choices and in the proclivity of those free choices to uh, go poorly for us. Um, we, they, the existentialist recognizes their abandonment, right? These are all like negative terms that you might say like a cynic and certainly a cynic would um, uh, adopt, but the, op the, the optimist in the existentialist takes them one step above and says, look, I'm not just being cynical. I'm not saying, well, screw all this. I'm not a nihilist. Uh, in fact, I say that um, these are the features of action, the features of the human condition that make it up and that the only way to act authentically is to accept these features and act anyways, to act with them, to use them as inspiration. So the abandonment felt in anguish certainly leads to despair, but there is always action, whether we do or don't. There's always continued pan painting, right? Painting our own portrait. And importantly, there's always the ability to do work authentically on good faith. For this, for the existentialist, this is enough. So we should recall the charges levied against existentialism, the first being that existentialism leads to quietism and inaction, right? And this is his response to that first objection. So what we have left to do is deal with the common everyday person mm -hmm. objection that existentialism leads to an inhumanism, right? The, you, you are a stranger, you weirdo, right? So existentialist subjectivity. As our point of departure, there can be no other truth than this. I think, therefore, I am. Cogito, ergo sum. This is the absolute truth of consciousness, of consciousness confronting itself. Any theory that considers man outside of this moment of self-awareness is, at the outset, a theory that suppresses the truth. For the outside of this Cartesian cogito, all objects are merely probable, and a doctrine of probabilities not rooted in any truth crumbles into nothing. In order to define the probable, one must define what is true. 
Therefore, in order to define any truth, therefore, for any truth to exist, there must first be an absolute truth, which Sartre says is the, the cogito, the I think, therefore, I am. So the absolute truth and subjectivity is only a starting point, however, right? Um, it's where the existentialist project begins. And so for those of you who may not have read Descartes before, um, uh, it, I, I take it for granted that like everybody has read Descartes because <laughs> I've read Descartes going on 15, 20 times now, like every intro to philosophy class, every epistemology, like just every philosophy class ever deals with Descartes. Um, so if there are those among you who have not read the meditations, uh, what Descartes does is he says, look, I'm now like a 50 year old dude. Uh, and I've been taught in the university in the academy. I've learned from books and all of this knowledge has been given to me. I just sort of assumed that it was true because it seemed to hold together and make sense of the world, but I never really checked. Right. Um, so what, what if I get rid of all that? What if, what if I, I want to like only have true actual knowledge, like truth with a capital T. What if, what if this is what I want? Um, then I can't just read a book and trust it. I need to come up with this knowledge for myself. Uh, and so he begins the project of the meditations. He sits in his armchair by the fire. It's a beautiful read, it's lovely. Um, and thinks, and he says, well, uh, you know, sometimes I look at sticks and they're straight. And then sometimes I look at sticks that are in water and they look bent. So I certainly can't trust my senses to give me knowledge, that truth with a capital T, um, because they're wrong sometimes. They can deceive me, okay? So if I want knowledge or truth with a capital T, I can't just perceive the world. Um, so what if I just have this like sense of reality, this a priori kind of like, uh, this is real, you know, like that's a table, that's thick and solid. Uh, well, you know, sometimes that can be put in a doubt too. I can be deceived about this is solid. Um, my claim may not be true with a capital T because I could be dreaming, right? I could be uh, having a very realistic dream, which people do have, right? like incredibly lucid, realistic dreams um, where you wake up and think, I just had today, right? Uh, I've, I've had these dreams where I wake up and think to myself, well, damn it, I just like showered and got dressed and was like walking out the door and now I got to do it all over again. Um, they're weird dreams, but this is like the, the other way to doubt. So, so not Descartes says, look, I, I can't trust my senses to give me truth with capital T. I can't trust my a priori sense of like what reality is to give me um, truth with capital T. What if, what if I say like two and two is four? Is, is that true with a capital T? Well, I require my mind to, to process this calculation and I could be mind controlled by an evil genius, someone who has all this power to make me think what I want to think or, or don't want to think. He, that this evil genius could flick around the switches in my brain uh, and make me think that two and two is four when really it's five. So even my like a priori mathematical knowledge isn't true with a capital T, or at least I can't yet verify it as such. Uh, so what's left? And Descartes says, I feel as if I'm uh, halfway swirling through a whirlpool where I can't touch the bottom, nor can I reach the top for air uh, at this moment in the meditation. It's a really cool moment. So what does he do? He says, well, even if I'm being deceived, I'm thinking. Because for a deceiver to deceive me, I must be thinking. Therefore, I am. Right? And this is the cogito. And from the cogito, uh, Descartes offers uh, an epistemic principle. It's like the natural light of illumination that uh, shines upon certain ideas when they are consistent with an ontological proof for God's existence that is consistent with all of mechanical sciences, proofs and experiments and stuff. And so he can get all of his knowledge back that he got rid of in the first place. So that's, that's Descartes' cogito. The I think moment though, where you're in this whirlpool where you can't like breathe and you can't touch the ground. This is also the starting moment of existentialism. This is where Sartre is saying the subjective moment of our project begins here with your, ex if existence precedes essence, the moment, the moment that you encounter that existence, your existence is the moment of the cogito for Descartes. So this absolute truth and subjectivity is the only starting point. And subjective here doesn't mean like, 
oh, well, I feel it's this way and you feel it's that way. So like, obviously our opinions are subjective. No, no, it's, that's not the right subjective here. The subjective is to say that it is internal to you. And, and we all have this subjective, it's a universal subjective experience, right? Um, but I can't like know that you've had it. I just sort of like you've had it, right? Um, so it's subjective in that the experience exists internally, not that it is like wishy-washy or fluid or whatever, the way that we are relativists about subjectivism these days. Um, so in contrast to Descartes, the existentialists affirm that the I think is inspired by direct contact with the other, that in fact, one does not encounter oneself until one encounters the other, that the cogito is not something that you do sitting in your armchair, thinking really hard and doubting, but rather in existing and coexisting. And it's the co that makes the existing important. It's the coexistence that has you recognize in yourself that I am a thinking thing. So it's this interaction between two existences, preceding essence, that says, oh, I am a thing. You're, you're, you're a thing too. I'm a, we're, we're things, right? We're thinking things. So when we encounter others, we reflectively look into ourselves and realize, oh, there I am. Sartre says, I cannot discover any truth whatsoever about myself except through the mediation of another. The other is essential to my existence as well as to the knowledge I have of myself. Under these conditions, my intimate discovery of myself is at the same time a revelation of the other as a freedom, the other is this freedom, right, that confronts my own, my own freedom, what I am, and that cannot think or will without doing so for or against me. We are thus immediately thrust into a world we may call intersubjectivity. It is in this world that man decides what he is and what others are. So is the alternate materialist view of the other unnatural and in bad faith? So, so when I say the materialist view here, this is again, like another sort of place to have a discussion. As I was reading this and like constructing the lecture, I was thinking to myself, why, why? Right, like there, there's not really an argument for this. This is sort of like a naturalistic claim. It's just it's the way things go. Um, the alternative view of the other is is a solipsistic one, right? A materialist one is to say, uh, well, I think I am, but you're just an object for me to use, abuse, be around, whatever. You know, you're a figment of my imagination, right? Is is Sartre right in saying that our at, at our encountering another, we encounter a freedom. And we're not really just encountering some material thing that people that we encounter are existences in themselves and, and not only uh, essences through our own existence. Or do you agree with Sartre that to encounter another is to encounter oneself in reflection? Well, isn't he suggesting that we're encountering the other as a kind of thou, like Martin Buber says, and I and thou that we're encountering the other as in good faith as a thou, not as an object, not not as a a foil mm -hmm. for our yeah, own exactly. civilization. Yeah. So so th this is a cool point. Um I, I wish we had time to read I now. It's a really neat book. Um but what Buber says in I now is is that you can say you or you can say thou. It's sort of antiquated. Um, and, and if not antiquated, then just not a part of the English language. So in Spanish, there's tu and usted, right? Where usted is like the formal, uh, I'm, I'm recognizing uh, you as like an entity worthy of respect, individuation, whatever. And tu is just like informal you, you know? Um, so the thou, you might translate usted as, as thou um, in that, the, the encountering of another is not to encounter a you, but to encounter an usted, a thou, a, a, a something that is like a manifest kind of godliness for, for Buber. But um, in, in Sartre's case here, a manifest freedom, an existence. Um, so it, that, that's, that's totally what um, Sartre is getting at, Sarah. Uh, Zachary asks, subjective, kind of like you taste something, but someone else does. No. So it's the subjective that it's not. Uh, so uh, the fact that we taste things is subjective, right? We all have experiences of flavor, and I, you know, it's I can't like objectively measure that fact that you're having an experience of flavor, but we all have 
right? It's subjective in that semi-objective sense. Okay, so does anybody else have thoughts, comments here about encountering the other and if Sartre is actually right in saying that when we encounter the other, we encounter, as Sarah mentions, the thou, right? Yeah, I, well, honestly, I, I think that uh, his action, uh, his radical freedom and his call to action, it implies the existence of others because if you're free, but you're the only one that's free, then really none of this other stuff matters. Morals wouldn't matter at that point because what are people other than objects? And then, you know, it, so I, I guess you, you have to kind of go farther back and just imply it from the, the outset because otherwise it's all for naught, I feel like. Good, so now I'm worried about a circular argument on Sartre's point, right? So that he, what he does is he says, we are radically free, therefore abandonment. And, uh, and, and uh, then when we encounter another, we recognize that we're radically free, which then gives us the way in which we encounter another. And then, right. oh, yeah. yeah, that would be a problem. Um, but, you know, he, he's at least committed to, to that story. Any other thoughts? Oh, Scott. Yeah, I, I guess I wanted to even broaden out the concept of seeing yourself in the other, which is that, you know, there are a lot of different meditative practices and such and contemplative practices where you conceptualize yourself as a part of a system and see yourself in the space that you're in, in the air that you're breathing, in, you know, whatever you happen to be around, and that it's not just encountering other people that you can have that experience with, but it's literally anything. <laughs> yeah, it's cool. Um, so, so one thing about the, the existentialist project is like, it's very individualistic. It's, it's the I think I am, right? Um, and strongly so, sternly so. Um, and so having a more holistic sense of self, I'm not entirely sure is very consistent with the existentialist project. But um, having the experience of other with not just another human being, but with like a system or environment of like an organized whole uh, is an interesting thought. And I, I think it's totally right um, that, that you do have that experience. And, and this is like what Kant would call the sublime is seeing this kind of expression in, in a natural organized system, um, a system of nature. The question is, do we treat that system of nature as equally free and radically responsible as humankind? Seems a little strange, but not inconsistent, which is why it's so strange. So interesting thought there. Um, thought real quick, I, sure. I was just thinking that um, wouldn't the the fact that your existence being contingent on your parents also like confirm the the existence of others in a, in the existential sense, since they lived and you are contingent on them, and you're kind of a continuation. So there must be others. I, I don't know how you could get existence without the other your, your parents or you know the progenitors. Yeah, there is at least one being for whom existence precedes essence. We may not be purely that being in, in a particular individual sense. Right. Humankind for sure, but in a particular sense, we're all contingent. Yeah. Um, Dallas, I would find it hard to believe in my own existence uh, if there was nothing or nobody else to confirm my existence. How would you know if you existed if nobody was able to confirm it? They, that's exactly right, that this is what Sartre is trying to, to get from us. So that this is a really good point, right? That it's only insofar as we encounter another, if you are uh, like a feral human on an island, you never need to interpret yourself as individuated being. Um, you only exist as a part of the world in which you are. And if that 
has no other reflective encountering beings with which to really no other than um, yeah you, you don't get the the I think and that this is why Sartre is going to eventually say that existentialism is a humanism because it connects us it it is this existentialist perspective that gives us humanity in an authentic way. So although it is impossible to find in every man a universal essence that could be said to comprise human nature, there is nonetheless a universal human condition. Man's fundamental situation in the universe, in this sense, human universality exists, but it is not a given. It is in perpetual construction. In choosing myself, I construct universality. I construct it by understanding every other man's project, regardless of the era in which he lives. The fundamental aim of existentialism is to reveal the link between the absolute character of the free commitment by which every man realizes himself in realizing a type of humanity and the relativity of the cultural ensemble that may result from such a choice. Really cool. I love this idea. I think it's a super neat one that the purpose of existentialism is to draw the link between cultural relativism, which is to say that every person self-actualizes in their own unique individual way, and there is a common universal human condition of condemnation to, to freedom. How do we make these two things work together? Uh, <coughs> communism, says Sartre, right? Mm -hmm. um, and if not communism, then at least this kind of problem, this question, I think is awesome. Because what it does is it says, look, everybody be yourself. Do you be free, but do it in a way that's authentic and works well with everybody else being themselves and doing them too. Super cool. If that is the problem that uh, every philosopher worked on, we'd live in a better world. If that was the problem that every pol politician was inspired by, we live in a much better world. It's not about me and mine, it's about us and ours, right? And us and ours inspired by the me and mine, right? That it's my encountering with others that I recognize the power of my freedom, the radical responsibility that I have, and then the need to respect that same quality in others. How does that work? That's the question. So is existentialism and inhumanism, especially given what Sartre has said here, um, Existentialists who commit to radical freedom may be unlike people. They may be Merceau-esque uh, in that they aspire to complete good faith, to complete authenticity, and this makes them act strangely. But are they truly strangers? How does this fundamental aim strike you? Can there be such a link between extreme subjectivity on the one hand and universal human condition on the other? And for the sake of time, we won't break out in discussion, but I think this is a question for all of us to reflect on. What do we think when we see this, when we read this, is there a link and do we have an intuition? Like, oh, there should be, right? Um, and if so, develop that thought. That's a thought worth having. So just to complete out the lecture, willing freedom, what do we do now? Man is his own project and always becoming. There is no a priori way to decide how to act because existence precedes essence. Man makes himself. He does not come into the world fully made. He makes himself by choosing his own morality and his circumstances are such that he has no other option than to choose a morality. We can define man only in relation to his commitments. And if our commitments are actualized by our freely willing them, then freedom lies at the heart of acting authentically. Freedom is the, the again, the linchpin, the, the, the touchstone that holds together the rest of the universal human condition. Progress implies, imp implies improvement, says Sartre. But man is always the same, confronting a situation that is forever changing. While always choice remains a choice in any situation. The world is full of twists and turns, but what remains the same is that we, what remains the same is uh, how we choose to lean into or against those curves. Um, and that choice is up to us, right? Freedom is at the heart of the project of being yourself. So when I affirm freedom, says Sartre, under any circumstance can have no other aim than itself, freedom itself. And once a man realizes this in a state of abandonment, that it is he who imposes values, he who can will but one thing, freedom is the foundation of all values. And in order to be free, everyone around us must be free as well. My ability to choose, express freedom depends on living without constraints. And if we live in a society of constraints, then we're all held back. So my freedom depends on yours, on not constraining one another, on working together. 
And together by willing for the sake of freedom, we work together to become uninhibited ourselves from the latent social constraints that hold us back from these systems that guide and force and, and direct our will. So if you choose to act in bad faith or in philosophical suicide, you make your particular choice freely, but you constrain freedom generally. And so by acting in bad faith, what you've done is you've, um, you've, ch you've chosen a course of action freely and then limited the universal amount of freedom that there is. And this will come back to bite you in the ass, right? I'm obliged to will the freedom of others at the same time as my own, Sartre says. I cannot set my own freedom as a goal without also setting the freedom of others as a goal. Consequently, when operating on the level of complete authenticity, I've acknowledged that existence precedes essence and the man is a free being who under any circumstance can only ever will his freedom. I have at the same time acknowledged the freedom of others. So who is the sort of person, just as a hypothetical, and I have an idea in mind, I'm, I'm being a little ironic here, who's the sort of person who um, makes themselves as free and as powerfully free as they possibly can at the cost of everybody else's freedom? I want to thank every Amazon employee and every Amazon customer because you guys paid for all of this. Seriously, for every Amazon customer out there and every Amazon employee, thank you from the bottom of my heart very much. It's very appreciated. As he looks down on all of us from space in his giant rocket. What a guy, right? Who, this, this, this is the quintessential example of bad faith. Jeff Bezos, the, the capitalist, um, uh, oligarch who controls all of the wealth and power that they want. He could end poverty like that, but he chooses to go to space and then says, hey, thanks for paying for all that, you weak little <laughs> customers, right? Yeah. yeah, What what's happening here is in order to exert and express the complete extent of a person's freedom, they absorb and diminish so many others. This is acting in bad faith. This is the sort of person that Sartre is saying, yeah, this is problematic, right? This is the sort of person that uh, next week Beauvoir is going to uh, rail against. She's going to say, look, the, the bourgeoisie um, uh, uh, manager who says, I'm just you know, looking out for me and mine is really acting in bad faith when they say this because they are not acting in a way that is uh, consistent with freedom universally, though it is consistent with their own freedom. And this is the bad faith. This is where the wires cross, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> I don't see that exactly that way. No? Isn't he the person that is making the most of his life by his own? Means? At what cost? But all at the cost of, I mean, the people that you're referencing that are impoverished or whatever, like based on the principles in here, that's of their own doing. And they could have risen up. They could have chosen to not work for him. They could have chosen a better path or a yeah. different path. Like that's play, that's painting those people as victims, which this does not assert. Sure. So there are still power structures, um, which is what this doesn't get us the political. This only makes existentialism consistent with the political message. Beauvoir will will give the power structure argument in uh, the ethics of ambiguity. Um, so- And I agree with you, I think he sucks, but- <laughs> Yeah, yeah, so, so, so but this, this, you're right, this is a good objection for sure. Um, the idea is that we can, by acting in bad faith, you can act in a way that sets up a system. They, they, what you've done is you've, you've universally validated a way of acting that diminishes um, our ability to be authentic, our ability to be free overall, right? Um, so, uh, Hitler, great example, right? Um, most powerful man in the world for a time uh, and did it on the back of, of you know, genocide, right? Um, and what, <laughs> what does genocide do is it, it you know, uh, gives him a whole lot of power to be as free as he wants and removes the freedom of, yeah. He says he cares about, Bezos, you know, for, for this example, says he cares about workers while actively, you know, union busting mm -hmm. behind the scenes. That's know, right. Or yeah. lobbying yeah. in D.C. for certain anti-worker policies. Right. So yeah. Yeah, that's the definition of bad faith. Creating yeah. a system of work that has people working 12 hours in mindless ways. I, I've written an article on this um, in, uh, 
in two places. One is in a, a Chilean magazine um, and another is in um, this magazine called Global Voices on uh, Amazon warehouse workers and uh, digital automation work generally and, and how it's harmful to us. And um, yeah, I mean, I mean, this is a guy who is a super villain for sure. He he's like Le Lex Luthor wearing a cowboy hat, yeah, sure. and, and this is this is bad faith, right? This is the sort of person that uh, this this is this sort of person would be analog to the aristocrat of Sartre's time that is inspiring his his Marxism, his very radical Marxism. Well, I I mean, just think like I think the bad faith especially comes in at having a giant rocket be your your passion project, right? So, I mean, he has the freedom to choose to amplify other people's freedom, all these workers. And instead of doing that, instead of investing back into his employees, he, he invests it in himself into just blowing up money. And basically. then says, yo, hey, yeah, thanks thank for you. that. Yeah. Yeah. I couldn't believe that quote Marx. That quote was like. Yeah. I mean, it just shows it, it is so, it, it is the theater of the absurd, right? Just like right before our eyes. Th this guy has no idea, yeah. isn't it? No idea. I bet he has no idea. I bet he wouldn't even get close to being able to guess how much it costs the average person to do laundry, yeah. right? You no, know, not about this, but when you're talking about the communism, you earlier, you were talking about like the early form of communism, but not like Stalin and Lenin. So what is it, I'm not an expert by any means or, or on communism, but it wouldn't be a lot of the communism of today either, right? Because those nations like China, North Korea, like they don't have choices. They don't have freedoms. They're told how things are going to be. Yeah. So that's a different, mm -hmm. it's a whole different uh, morphing yeah. of communism, right? More of a dictatorship versus. Yeah. So, so communism is a bad word in America nowadays uh, because of our political disagreements with say like the USSR and stuff, but the, the, like, it's it's important to distinguish I, for this reason the bad word reason communism from say like something like Marxism and then even in like today's intellectual climate Marxism has similar it's been loaded with all sorts of debate for decades that causes it to be something that it's not um, at this point Marxism is pretty freshly what it was it was start like the, the debate was just starting right. Um, and so what Marx says is, hey, you're so many more than your managers. Why do you get paid so much less? Why, why is there such an inequality of wealth? Do something about it. Class work, like class differences for the true evil, basically, right? Redistribution of things like that. Yeah. It's, it's the excess value that the people are sucking in the, the capitalist system. Uh, they don't have to and in bad faith and we'll, we'll see this in much greater detail through the ethics of ambiguity yeah. uh, Beauvoir does a really good job of um, expressing these arguments so finally existentialism is a humanism humanism is not meant to be understood in its original theistic way that there's some like human essence and that we're realizing it this is the value uh, that that makes us great and that by acting in in ways consistent with the value, we uh, make the world a beautiful, better place. This is like the idea of the Renaissance and of the Enlightenment, right? Um, for the Renaissance, it was like the artistic spirit, yeah. the soul, and for the Enlightenment, it's reason, rational nature. The existentialist does away with this kind of valuation, but leaves in place the importance of understanding life as a project of art, and each of us as the artificer of their own life. Humanism for the existentialist just means that we're all human. We all share this universal human condition. We're all condemned to be free and we're condemned together. So let's work together. By recognizing in despair and anguish our collective abandonment, we are given reason to act, not to be quiet, but to work. And an action to will authentically without excuse is to will for the sake of all beings freedom. And in this sense, existentialism is a kind of optimism and a kind of humanism. It's a doctrine of action that makes living well together in our universally shared condition authentically possible. So argues Sartre. Cool, stop the recording.